uh, wherever you are, but in Geneva, of course, after lunch. Uh, excellencies, delegates, uh, colleagues, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me let me share my screen. Uh, just a second, please. And I will go through some slides today. Okay. I think we're all set here. Okay. So I'm really looking forward myself to understand the WTO debate on, on, on the, the greening of agricultural subsidies. What I will try doing today is, is to try to set the stage for such an interesting conversation. Uh, and I will be a little bit more, uh, a little broader than uh, focusing only on agricultural subsidies. Uh, and you will understand in a second uh, why that is the case. I will basically try to walk through to some slides that help us answer a key question that we have in front of us, which is how can agricultural public support contribute to food security, nutrition, and of course, climate outcomes. And we can even put it broader than that, nature-friendly outcomes. So what I'll try to do today is uh, first tell you a little bit of uh, why FAO has been uh, involved in this work, uh, noting that already the topic is important for the case, but recently it has been momentum into the topic. And what I can tell you is that uh, back in two, two years ago, we started some work with UNDP and UNEP uh, on the issue of, of, of uh, agricultural public support. And we produced a report that was quite influential at the moment, uh, a multi-billion dollar opportunity repurposing agricultural support to transform our good systems. And what we can see is that uh, ever since there have been a number of reports that have been produced uh, on this topic of agricultural support. Uh, this is about subsidies today, but subsidies is part of what I call here agricultural support. Uh, and what these reports all show ever since we produced the multi-million dollar opportunity report in 2021 uh, is that agricultural support provides vast transfers to farmers. That's, that's very important to understand. Uh, and I will show uh, how vast they are, uh, but also that uh, there have been some good outcomes from these transfers. Uh, particularly, you know, some of these transfers have been able to boost agricultural output they have boosted global food production, of course, uh, particularly of staple crops. And these, of course, have been very helpful to reduce hunger and poverty in the world. And we have to note that. It's very important that we note that. However, uh, there are also concerns about how uh, this support is impacting sustainability, uh, how it is impacted people, the health of people. And not only that, but also how some of the support measures are distorting markets and agri-food systems, those uh, affecting efficiency in agri-food systems. So all that concern has actually uh, resulted in the production of these reports. And most recently, FAO has partnered with the, with the, with the partners of the SOFI report, you know, the state of food security and nutrition in the world. And we have gone deeper into trying to understand how agricultural policy support uh, affects also access to healthy diets. Uh, now, all in all, if you see all this report, what is clear is that uh, there, is, there is agreement these days, if I may say that, even though you may consider that there is a lot of debate already and disagreement for decades, but there is agreement uh, overall uh, about the need to repurpose agricultural public support to ensure that it helps, you know, make agri-food systems more sustainable, greener, if you may call it uh, that way, uh, but also more equitable. Uh, now, uh, let me show you what, what, kind of, what kind of numbers are we talking about here in terms of support? And this is very, very important because uh, uh, agricultural support is, is, is broader than subsidies. Uh, and as this figure shows, worldwide, support to food and agriculture accounted for almost uh, 630 billion US dollars per year on average in the period from 2013 to 2018. Uh, and it's very important to know that producers take the lion's share of all this support globally, which is about 70%. Now, as you can see in the picture, it is not all about subsidies. Uh, most of the support producers get is to price incentives, uh, followed by fiscal subsidies. And I will explain what price incentives are because they are quite important, as you can see in this image. 
Uh, these price incentives include border measures on imports and exports. Here we are talking about, for example, import tariffs, uh, quotas, export taxes, bans or licensing, etc. Uh, and also include market price controls. And here we are talking about administered prices at which governments procure food uh, from farmers, or also minimum producer price policies. So as you can see, fiscal subsidies are very important as well, but we have to be mindful of what we call price incentives, because it is very important to talk about them. And probably a lot of people, what they regard as subsidies also is included in what we call price incentive. But fiscal subsidies are separate from price incentives, so to speak. Overall, what we see is that the support largely concentrates on a few staples, and I will show that in a second. Now, it's very important to see that uh, there are also negative price incentives, which you can see on the left-hand side of the graph. Uh, and this is because uh, lower middle-income countries in particular, uh, and low-income countries as well, penalize farmers through policies that depress farm gate prices, of course, to protect poor consumers. Now, let me, let me show you a bit, a bit uh, some, some detail on, 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 on how this support is, is, is going all over the world. And, and what we can see clearly in this table is that the, the, the policy support to food and agriculture, by now you know what I mean by public, uh, uh, public support to food and agriculture. Again, if I go back, it means all of these types of support, which go beyond subsidies and include price incentives, but also, as you can see in this graph, and I forgot to mention, it includes general service support, which is the support that benefits collectively both producers and consumers and all people, such as infrastructure, for example, or research and development. And also, you have some subsidies that go directly to the consumer, but these are a minority compared to overall support. Now, if we go back to the overall support, we can see that it differs across country income groups, uh, and this reflects also important between countries inequalities. Uh, and overall, price incentives and fiscal subsidies have been the most widely used in high-income countries, but they are becoming increasingly more popular across middle-income countries, in particular those at the upper level of income. Uh, and middle-income countries uh, as well use fiscal subsidies, uh, but they just accounted for 5% of the total value of their production, versus, for example, 13% in high-income countries. Uh, and as you can see here, low-income countries uh, are those who have the less space to provide policy support to food and agriculture. Uh, now, it is also very important to understand that uh, policy support to food and agriculture also differs across food groups and commodities. However, differences vary across country income groups. Here, for example, you can see in this graph that overall, uh, support to agricultural production largely concentrates on staple foods, dairy, and other protein-rich foods, especially in high-income countries and also upper middle-income countries. And rice, sugar, and meats of various types uh, are the foods most incentivized worldwide, while producers of fruits and vegetables are less supported overall or are even penalized in some low-income countries. So this is a very interesting picture to look at. You know, you see, for example, high income countries are the only ones who have a very interesting uh, amount of support, uh, both to price incentives and subsidies to producers to this limited number of uh, commodities. Now, if one needs to wrap up all this evidence and say what, what is going on, uh, let me just share a few points here on what we learned from this evidence. Uh, first of all, we learned that fiscal subsidies have significantly contributed to growing production and reducing the prices of staple foods, uh, cereals in particular, such as maize, wheat, and rice, but also of beef and milk. And, and of course, this has positively impacted food security and farm income, as I said at the beginning. Uh, however, these fiscal subsidies have also encouraged monocultures in some countries, uh, seizing the farming of certain nutritious foods which is important, uh, uh, and also discouraging the production of some nutritious foods uh, that are sustainable, that can be produced more sustainably. Uh, also border measures, and this is very important because as you may remember, border measures 
are included within price incentives, which take the bulk of all the, the policy support that we see in the world, uh, they affect the availability, diversity, and prices of food in domestic markets. And while some of these measures target important policy objectives, such as, for example, food safety, governments could do more to reduce trade barriers for nutritious foods, such as fruits and vegetables, in order to increase the availability and affordability of such foods to reduce, of course, the cost of healthy diets, provided that they are produced and traded sustainably. Uh, last but not least, in low-income countries and middle-income countries, market price controls, which are also within the price incentives that I was talking about, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, uh, they are targeting commodities like our wheat, maize, rice, as well as sugar, uh, with the objective of stabilizing or raising farm incomes, incomes while ensuring supplies of key staples, of course, for food security purposes. However, these policies are contributing to imbalanced diets all over the world, which are also not sustainable. Now, what would happen if all the countries in the world would get together and would say, listen, let's try to you know, reallocate all this public support in ways that would help us reduce the gap between what people are consuming now and what people should be consuming uh, 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 in terms of healthy diets. So we have uh, conducted a few scenarios uh, with IFPRI uh, that would simulate, for example, from now up to 2030, what would happen if all the countries, for example, reallocate fiscal subsidies from producers to consumers to bridge gaps in healthy consumption patterns, or alternatively, uh, we reallocate fiscal subsidies among producers we wouldn't be moving here from producers to consumers, but we would be reallocating within producers uh, to bridge gaps in healthy consumption patterns. We wanna eat healthy. So we wanna use all these incentives to promote the production and the consumption of healthy diets. Or what would happen if we reallocate support to price incentives, which is the border mergers and the, and the market price controls to bridge gaps in healthy consumption patterns. Now, uh, we find that with the same money, countries could um, unambiguously improve the affordability of healthy diets. And this is what we have in this table. As you can see from the table, the green arrows represent positive gains and all three scenarios of repurposing lead to large gains in improving the affordability of healthy diets, which is the last column in the table. They can also reduce undernourishment and poverty, which are desirable results of any reallocation of support. However, as you can see in this table, depending on the scenario, there could be trade-offs and negative uh, repercussions from these repurposing scenarios in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, agricultural production levels, and farm incomes. The bottom line is that the magnitude and direction of the trade-offs vary by region and even by country, and will need to be analyzed very carefully. Now, to get into the last slide that I want to show, which is uh, very concrete into what you are discussing today in, in the panel discussion, uh, repurposing agricultural support can also become a, a public finance mechanism that helps leverage private investment uh, in, for example, climate change adaptation and mitigation, as well as nature conservation, increasing the finance available for investments that traditionally investors and farmers themselves would consider too risky. So I will give you, for example, of what I'm talking about here. Uh, public funds that are today uh, allocated to you know, subsidize farmers, for example, or any other kind of support could be repurposed to develop and disseminate more emission efficient technologies for crops and livestock. This could reduce the cost and the risks associated with such technologies, uh, helping to increase technology adoption particularly by small farmers. And here the business case for private investment is clear. Not only will there be economic payoffs, but also a reduction in emissions from agriculture. Uh, land could be restored to national habitats. Uh, agricultural support and including subsidies could also be repurposed, reallocated uh, to reward the sustainable management of forests, farmlands, oceans, and biodiversity. For example, by reallocating resources to encourage landowners to plant or maintain trees on their land. Here, you know, using trees is important as collateral for loans and can be a strategy to de-risk smallholder projects. 
It can also promote carbon sequestration, thus resulting in more carbon credit capacity, which is potentially a funding source for private investment, of course. Now, this idea would be pretty much aligned with resource-oriented mechanisms, such as the UN Red Plus, which I trust you all know very well. In this case, once countries demonstrate Red Plus results to the UNFCCC in terms of reduction in emissions from this deforestation and forest degradation, they receive a reimbursement of funds to invest in, for example, a forest management and integrated livestock, such as we see in the case of Argentina, or well, community-based forestry. That we, such as I promise Canada. you we did not cut his feed out of uh, aversion to um, repurposing subsidies. Excuse me? You are back. Yeah. So, so the, third, the third option that, 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 that we have is that agricultural subsidies and support in general could also be repurposed to provide tax discounts to agri-food enterprises that meet sustainability standards and promote youth and women engagement. Uh, for example, to the adoption of renewable energy or the rehabilitation and modernization of existing, existing irrigation infrastructure and so forth. Last but not least, another idea would be to repurpose agricultural subsidies and all the support uh, to allocate ecological fiscal transfers to subnational governments that demonstrate improved management and conservation of ecosystems. To conclude, it is very important to say just one point, uh, the repurposing of trade measures and fiscal subsidies can indeed contribute to reduce the cost of healthy diet with more sustainability, uh, but it will have to consider countries' commitments and flexibilities under the rules of the WTO which I believe is the topic of discussion in the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco, for a really comprehensive overview of, I think, both uh, some of the options on what can be done as well as the state of play in subsidies. One of the things that I always really benefit from when we do things that sort of connect the Geneva bubble to organizations like the FAO in Rome is the stark difference in what in some of the elements of the conversation. In Geneva, we tend to talk about agriculture in terms of values of production, export volumes, whereas your presentation in many ways focused on what are the kinds of things people are eating. Are we providing people with a healthy diet? Are we incentivizing healthy diets? And I don't think that, while that has from time to time emerged, I think, in the Geneva conversation, it really is a useful way to connect um, connect these two things and bring some of those into our discussions. Um, so I'm tremendously grateful for that. And I think it really sets us up for the fireside chat uh, discussion now with with Doa and and Alice. Because Marco's, you know, Marco at one point said there's overall agreement on the need to green subsidies. Well, if there, there's overall agreement, I think it would be legitimate to ask for someone in the audience to ask, well, then what is the problem? Um, and I think in this case, it's, it's a good opportunity to turn to you, um, maybe begin with you, Doa, as from the WTO Secretariat, to let's begin at the absolute highest level. Why is the WTO a part of this or relevant to this conversation at all? What is the, what is the role of the organization? What does it do when it comes to subsidies? Thank you very much uh, for this, and I apologize for my voice. Uh, I've had a long bout of COVID, and I'm not completely back. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, Marco, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I wanted to start uh, this discussion with a bit of myth busting, if you will. Um, the first myth in this discussion, in my opinion, has to do with... Um, with something that one hears repeatedly around Geneva and around the WTO, that the WTO has not addressed sustainability and that agricultural sustainability is somehow a new issue for the WTO. Now, that is a myth. Why? Because trade in agriculture, trade in any agricultural product, trade in a, in a tomato, in a cucumber, in anything else, is trade in land, in water, and in energy. So any kind of removal of a trade distortion, it would make 
um, uh, would make, uh, would contribute to sustainability. So trade not only leads, open trade not only leads to an efficient allocation of, uh, of resources, it leads to an efficient allocation of natural resources too. It, need, it leads to an efficient allocation of that land, of that water, and of that energy. So the idea that the WTO has not been addressing sustainability, I think is fundamentally flawed. Um, any kind of trade liberalization by definition is contributing to food being produced where, where it ought to. Uh, I'm Egyptian and the United Nations Development Program always likes to tell Egypt, if you were to aim for self-sufficiency in food, you would need three river Niles, not one. So that's myth number one, that the WTO has not been addressing sustainability. It hasn't called it sustainability, but it has certainly been addressing it. Myth number two, that... <clears throat> What we need to do is to green subsidies. Yes, we do. But we need to be greening and we need to be removing all obstacles to trade. A tariff is a subsidy to a domestic producer and any kind of trade distortion is an ungreening of agricultural trade. So we need to be addressing all trade distortions just as, as we have been doing because anything that distorts that movement of land, water and energy embodied in a food is something that is reducing um, the, an efficient allocation of natural resources. Number three, clearly there are some things that the WTO can do, but there are some things that the WTO cannot do. The, clearly there is a need for accompanying national policies. So uh, insofar as in an agricultural system, a country is not pricing water, then, uh, we are no longer trading in the based on the true cost of food. So national policies, effective national environmental policies that allow us to get to the true cost of food on the basis of which international trade then takes place are absolutely vital. And myth number four, and I guess, uh, you know, I mentioned that this fourth myth because we're uh, supposed to address a wider audience here, not just the trade uh, experts and uh, um, is the myth around the green box. Because the WTO agreement on agriculture has a particular architecture of boxes, which I think Alice will be speaking to later, um, and one of those boxes is a green box, uh, I think the wider public tends to think that that box is about green measures, environmentally uh, sort of uh, helpful measures. That green box instead is simply about permissible agricultural subsidies in the WTO, subsidies for which the WTO does not place a ceiling. It's called green because we use a traffic light system from amber to, you know, uh, we have a series of lights, if you will, um, that are intended to signal to WTO members what the trading system considers okay and what it doesn't consider okay. And we have a green box and that green box is not about environmentally sound subsidies. That, that was never its intent. It's also about rural development. It's also about income support to poor farmers. It's, it's, it's many things. Um, and so I think that creates a bit of confusion in the discussion. Um, I think when governments come to the WTO to discuss agriculture, they will never come to discuss it exclusively from an environmental lens. Trade policy in agriculture um, has to achieve many different objectives. Um, it has to achieve, number one, food security, which is a very, very big issue at the WTO. We're in the middle also of a food and fertilizer price crisis. So, as you can imagine, food security is way at the top of the list. But, it, you know, governments want uh, the agricultural sector and agricultural trade to also fulfill employment objectives, to also fulfill economic and GDP growth objectives, and so on. Now, can the WTO green agricultural subsidies the topic of today's conversation? Well, I think the WTO needs to continue the process of agricultural reform as mandated in all areas of trade distortions, it needs to finish that unfinished business. Could it go further and could it take an exclusively environmental lens to some issues? Well, yes, in the permissible, that huge permissible box that we call green subsidies or green box in the WTO, there you could begin to apply an exclusively, you know, or a specific environmental lens to say, well, you know, maybe that subsidy that hurts the environment, maybe that shouldn't be WTO greened. Um, so, 
perhaps we could go down that route. But I think the point that I'm trying to make here is that the entire WTO agricultural reform agenda is about sustainability. And sustainability is absolutely not new to the WTO. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think you, you kind of dance around the shape of where the WTO rules lie on some of this stuff. And I wonder if I could bring in Alice here um, to maybe spell out in a little bit more in a little bit more detail, but hopefully without a, a, a seminar, uh, we haven't asked you to produce slides. Um, where do members, where do the rules lie and where might they constrain members versus where might members have space? Well, thanks, Dimitri, and thanks to both the Geneva Trade Platform and the FAO for the invitation. Um, a bit like Doha, I'm recovering not from COVID, but just from a cold. So if, if my cough overtakes me, um, I will cover my mouth to protect Dimitri and those in the audience. Um, so maybe let me take let me take the discussion just another step further into the, the boxes of different colors that Doa was talking about. Uh, and it, it's important kind of not to not to be overwhelmed by the boxes. I'm only going to talk about two. Um, because Dimitri, you asked about the rules that constrain subsidy provision and the rules that allow them. So the main rule for the purposes of all WTO members that constrains their agricultural subsidies is what's called the amber box. So though I talked about the traffic light system, amber box subsidies are subsidies that governments must notify to the WTO, but those are the subsidies that are subject to quantitative limits, right? So these are the subsidies that members decide distort production and distort trade. At the, at the root of it, the, the design of the rules is designed to, to moderate the impact of subsidies on trade principally. So the amber box, provides quantitative limits for members for those agricultural subsidies that distort production and distort trade. So for the we're talking about the repurposing of subsidies. So just as a sort of mental experiment, let's say the government of a WTO member wants to repurpose some of its agricultural subsidies from one kind of subsidy that distorts trade that it notifies in the amber box and it wants to move that to another kind of subsidy that is less environmentally harmful, but still distorts trade. So both of these, where it's coming from and where it's going are all within the amber box. In principle, nothing in the WTO rule book prevents a government from doing that. But what's important is to make sure that you're within the limits that the amber box sets for you. So just to give you a sense, Dimitri is talking about the value of production, just to give everyone a sense of how much we're talking about. So, every WTO member has what's called a de minimis limit within the amber box. So if you are a developed country, your de minimis limit of the subsidies that you can have in your amber box is 5% of the value of your agricultural production. If you're a developing country, you get 10% of the value of your agricultural production, and you can notify that amount, that value of subsidies within your amber box. So that's the first, and for most WTO members, the most constraining rule in the WTO's rule book. But going perhaps to the bottom of Doha's traffic light, there is the green box that she talked about. So this is sort of a box, a category of subsidies that WTO members can provide. And as Doha quite rightly pointed out, they're primarily called green because they are green lighted in the trade sense. They're green lighted because they are considered not or minimally trade distorting. So what sorts of things do we see there? It's things like uh, infrastructure services, building roads or ports or water facilities, dams, some environmentally related infrastructure, for example. So again, taking the repurposing example, just to make it a bit more concrete, WTO members could increase the amount that they spend in green box, non-trade distorting subsidies, right? They could change the nature of some of the, the subsidies that they provide within their green box to increase the environmental benefits of those subsidies. And in principle, because there are no quantitative limits to what you put in your green box, you could spend more or less as much as you wanted on those green box subsidies, as long, again, as long as you're not distorting production or trade in providing them. So I'll stop there. We can talk about how they combine in different ways, but I'll stop there for the moment. Thank you, I think that's a, that's a good, that's a really good overview of the structure of the rules. And I think if we were to continue that kind of hypothetical example, where uh, as Alice described, you have a member that wants to, that has the option of moving some of its within limit amber box support into other forms of amber box support, which it's allowed to do under the rules. It can spend more under green box. 
So then kind of what is the what is the problem? Or rather, what are members are members discussing sustainability and subsidies in the WTO? And what if they have these existing flexibilities? Are they discussing? Um, Doa, I might I might throw that throw that to you as you have to sit sit in the meetings and we don't. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so why aren't governments doing what we're discussing, right? Why aren't governments moving in that direction? Well, I would say first of all that governments have been moving in that direction. We've gone a long way in liberalizing agricultural trade. So uh, again, I would encourage the audience to take a very broad view of sustainability and how the trading system contributes to sustainability. The more, the more we have a, a trading system that reallocates resources, including natural resources efficiently, the more we are contributing to sustainability. And so, uh, you know, we've gone a long way with the uh, since the Uruguay round. I mean, we've um, we've uh, we've cut the trade distorting support significantly. We have uh, strict ceilings on the amber box. Um, uh, we we've gone so far that we're now even discussing whether the permissible box. Uh, and I think in this context, in this conversation, we should refer to it as the permissible box rather than the green box to avoid confusion. And now there's there's discussion as to whether that permissible box needs to be revisited, and whether um, whether everything that goes in there is 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 good for trade or or good you know or good for other things. So we have come a long way, um, and I think we we now need to go we need to go further. Uh, agriculture for the WTO in general is unfinished business. Um, you know the average agricultural tariff is multiple times the average bound industrial goods tariff. Um, so agriculture is way behind for historical reasons. Agriculture is an emotional issue. It's an outdoor activity. Farmers are very vocal. Uh, it's about our food systems. It's about our cultural systems. It's about our nutritional systems, our religious beliefs. It's about so many different things that progress has been slow relative to industrial goods. So we need to finish the unfinished business. It's hard to do because if you put yourself in the shoes of a government and you realize and you and you um, and you try to look at what a government, what a minister of agriculture has to look at when they when they take policies, uh, you realize how complex things are. You know, I mean, a, a minister of agriculture needs to make sure that there's enough food, that the food system is safe, uh, that the food is nutritious, um, uh, you know, there, there are many different goals that, that farmers are okay, that they have a decent livelihood. So, you know, they're not exclusively looking at this through an environmental lens, not to mention that climate change as an issue. And I think when we talk about greeting subsidies, it's really the climate discussion more than anything else that people, that some people have in mind today. But I think the climate issue um, has a different level of importance in different countries because countries are different levels of development and have different discount rates. So, you know, there are there are countries where people are dying today because there isn't enough food or because the food system is unsafe. So, you, you know, it's hard to ask them to prioritize the sustainability of their food system above the sort of food security and nutritional security and other issues that are far more pressing within that within their context. And, um, and so obviously that, um, that slows down the reform process uh, uh, quite a bit, but some of it is legitimate. And so I don't think that in the WTO we will ever ex exclusively be addressing uh, agricultural trade policy from an environmental lens, and, and it would be wrong to do so. We do need to do it, but it can't be the exclusive point of view. Thank you, Dara. Um, I wanted to drill into some of what I think you 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 alluded to there, which is the debate. You know, you talked about the progress that's been made um, and the lack of progress in other areas, and that's been the practice of that has been years of debate at the WTO between members, um, and kind of noting that this session has what I think I described as as four levels of nonpartisan, because the GTP is nonpartisan, the FAO is nonpartisan, the WTO Secretariat is nonpartisan, and IISD is nonpartisan. So without kind of asking you to, to pick winners or, or take sides, Alice, I wonder if you could just briefly outline for us what is the, who are the players or the the, the general positions traditionally in discussions about subsidies, and does introducing this question or kind of a greater prominence to client to discussions around climate change and sustainability change um, those positions at all 
Okay. Um. So. Or, or die. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 you can no, go first, and then we can pass to us. I was keen to hear what Doa had to say about this. So I'm going to go first, and um, she can correct me because again, she sits in the in the in the meeting rooms, and I really do not. So, and again, specifically because we as a as a think tank don't sit in the meeting rooms. Um, I think there's time at the end for questions and, and discussions. So if there are any national representatives listening, and I mischaracterize your position, I do it completely unintentionally. So please take the floor and correct me loudly and publicly. I don't mind. Um, so, so thinking about sort of positions in the agriculture negotiation, it is, as you say, Dimitri, let's start just by thinking about the, the very, very broad groups of countries and broad positions that we have in the agriculture negotiations, simply on the trade, on the basis of, of the trade impacts of, of subsidies and, and different kinds of market interventions. Um, and very, very broadly, there are countries with very offensive interests and defensive interests. So by offensive doesn't mean insulting, it means countries that actually want to change the rules, right, that want the rules to be different. Countries with defensive interests are those that more or less prefer the status quo, would prefer the rules to be to stay as they are. Um, so let's maybe talk first about the countries with traditionally, very traditionally, defensive interests simply in the, in the trade space. And this essentially is comprised mainly by a relatively small group of large WTO members who are large subsidizers. So there are some large, very developed economies like the EU, the United States, Japan perhaps, as well as perhaps a handful of larger developing countries, India and China. And I'm very conscious there that I'm lumping together extremely different economies with very different positions on particular issues, but very broadly in the defensive camp, you might put them there. Um, very broadly then on the offensive camp, the groups of country or the group of countries that wants the rules very much to change are often sort of very large agricultural producers who tend not to subsidize, right? So we're talking about Australia, uh, New Zealand in terms of dairy, but also a number of Latin American countries, Brazil, Argentina, for example. So that's ex written again, extremely broadly, kind of the two, the, def the defensive and the offensive groups of countries. And what is interesting, as you were saying, Dimitri, is that once you add in the question of what about the environmental effects of some of these subsidies, the nature of those groups changes slightly, right? So on the defensive side, there are some countries, um, Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, for example, who do appear to be quite interested in talking about the environmental effects of subsidies. They're not at all looking to close that discussion down. They're looking to have more of it and ask for more research and evidence. Um, so that's on the defensive side. On the offensive side, there are clearly some members of the offensive group, like the government of Australia, for instance, who are now very interested in discussing the environmental impact of subsidies. Um, but there are other members of that offensive group who remain very determined to keep the discussion at the WTO focused on the trade impacts of subsidies. Um, and I think, again, it's, and I think Doa was alluding to this, I don't think it's because of a, a lack of a lack of uh, interest in environmental sustainability at all. It's a question, I think, for them of where, of, for the, those who aren't so keen on the environmental impact of subsidies discussion, I, I think, and this is my own characterization, that it's it's sort of three different concerns, um, which can perfectly well exist together. And the first, I suspect, is there is a reluctance to have some of the WTO's airtime drawn into a discussion about the environmental impacts of subsidies and drawn away from a discussion which they still think is extremely important about the trade impacts of these subsidies. And Doa talked about the fact that in many cases, the agricultural agenda at the WTO is unfinished business. The reform of agricultural subsidies has been on the agenda for years and years and years and years and years. And apart from a few things, very little progress has been made. So those in the offensive camp want to keep the focus of the discussion on those trade impacts that are still unaddressed. unaddressed. So I think that's the first one. I think the second concern, at least as I understand it, is a fear that a discussion about envir the environmental impacts of subsidies and the environmentally positive impacts of some subsidies might open the door to a discussion about allowing more subsidies subs on the grounds that those subsidies are beneficial for the environment. 
And many developing countries, I, I think, feel very strongly that subsidization is a rich country's game. They don't have the money to subsidize and that more subsidies provided under the guise or, or effectively, but even under the guise of environmental protection would simply serve to further tilt the playing field in favor of developed country subsidies and production and against their own. And maybe the third argument, which is an interesting one, and I was alluded to it a few times, is that some of the countries who seem to be more resistant to this idea, in particular a number, a number from Latin America, emphasize that sustainability is not just about environmental sustainability, right? That in any discussion about sustainable development, we have to look at trade impacts, we have to look at environmental impacts, and we have to look at food security and social impact. And Doha's characterization of what an agricultural minister has to think about covers all of those things quite rightly, because that is the broader context of agricultural trade policy. So I'm gonna stop there. And I'm gonna see what Doha thinks of that same question. You were, okay, that was easy. <laughs> ticked off that box. I wanted to I wanted to really dig into to some of these, but there's there's a fourth concern I have heard, and I wanted to put it to you just in case I didn't understand it correctly, which is that there is a concern among some members, especially developing country members, that a move towards greening subsidies will eventually risks could eventually lay the groundwork for protectionism based on production methods. So effectively, stage one would be a rich country insisting that providing money to make sure that every farm's ground water is of, of a certain standard. And then phase two would be saying we will no longer allow entrance into our market unless they can verify, unless they can demonstrate to us that their groundwater also meets this standard that our farmers now meet thanks to our subsidies. Is that something you've heard? Is this me hallucinating? Um, to, to, Doa, you're, you're sort of nodding. Thank you. Um... Yes, absolutely. This is something that we hear, uh, but not just from WTO members, from the trade community. So um, on Thursday and Friday of last week, we held in the WTO um, uh, an event that was called Agri-Food Business Day, where we invited all the CEOs of big um, uh, big, big agri-food um, industries like the Nestle's and Unilever's of this world, um, agriculture banks, shipping industry, etc. <clears throat> And it was very interesting uh, uh, to hear their very consistent warning against um, environmental measures in agriculture turning into non-tariff barriers to trade. I think they 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 have a very big fear that um, that we could be heading down that road. Um, I think that was a very clear theme uh, throughout those two days. It was also, I would say, a very clear theme from some of the world's poorest countries. We had the ambassador of Cameroon, who was very vocal on this issue. And he said, look, attempts to fight deforestation in my country are leading to food insecurity. So, uh, you know, there needs to be a balance here between what you guys care about and what we have to care about at home. So yes, it's, it's a very consistent theme, uh, you know, how to balance environmental sustainability against other objectives that agricultural and food systems need to deliver. Um, and I, I think we, you know, we have instruments and we have tools and we have checks and balances within the WTO rule book, whether within the agreement on agriculture or outside it within the broader architecture that attempt to strike a balance between legitimate goals and goals that are not legitimate. Uh, legitimate public policy objectives and those that are uh, used as protectionism uh, rather than in pursuit of those other legitimate goals. Uh, and I think we, 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 so far we succeed in weeding out the legitimate from, from the non, I would say. But we, um, as we go forward in this discussion, I think we will continue to hear that concern, yes. Thank you. you. You said a word there that reminded me I've been neglectful. You, you mentioned the, the architecture, and I know there is nothing more that people at home love more than discussions about WTO architecture, but I do think it's, it's worth kind of getting into where some of these discussions are happening. Um, Alice, could you maybe just talk through, um, there, is, there is obviously a committee on agriculture, but where else do you think these debates are taking place? Super, thank you very much. Um, 
do you mind if I add an extra answer to the previous question, which I think is that in addition to the to the sort of the political challenges of, of even getting the discussion going in the WTO, and here is where, forgive me, I'm going to pull in the fishery subsidies reference. Forgive um, us. Because I, I suspect that sort of if and when this discussion gets going, members will inevitably have to face some of the challenges that we faced in the fishery subsidies negotiation of having to reach an agreement amongst themselves about what is a positive subsidy, if you were to do that, right? Um, and once you get into once you get into sort of defining a particular or reaching agreement on a single policy measure and agreeing that in every context this will be positive, your argument almost immediately starts to start to fall down because in every context things are different. So there's a there's lots of political reasons why the discussion is a an important one but a challenging one to have. And I suspect if it gets going, there'll be technical important technical questions to be answered, which can will also be challenging to reach agreement on around 164 members. Um, but you asked a little bit about the, the forum, all the different fora at the WTO. And you know what's interesting is that we, we came out of MC12, the big ministerial conference that the WTO held in June, um, with a couple of important outcomes related to food security. Fine, there was an exception for uh, exports by the World Food Program, for example, to ensure that WTO members would, by and large, allow those to leave their borders. Um, but what's been interesting is that there hasn't been a lot of progress since then in the formal negotiating committee, what's called the Committee on Agriculture in Special Session, COAS, to those of you who know it well. So there hasn't been a lot of progress since MC12 in the negotiations on new rules at the WTO. Um, but what's been interesting is that in the absence of that, there have been a couple of interesting developments in the regular Committee on Agriculture, so just the COA in the WTO. Um, and there, for example, they agreed just a few days ago quite an interesting decision which establishes a work program for more work on particular trade issues of interest to least developed countries and to a group of countries called the net food importing developing countries. So those developing countries that are most dependent on the trade system because they rely on imports of food to feed their population. So interestingly, we see sort of more bit more verve and a bit more sort of interesting conversations happening in the regular agricultural committee, at least for now. Um, so those are those are two places where some interesting agricultural policy work is happening. But the other place within the WTO's architecture, or rather, at least within the WTO building, um, that agricultural subsidies are beginning to become uh, a topic of, of discussion is an initiative, it's not a formal committee, but an initiative called the Trade and Environment Structured Discussions or trade and environmental sustainability structured discussions. And this essentially is an initiative developed by a group of members. Um, some have joined since then. I think there's about 74 or so of them who are now part of this very informal working process where they discuss different aspects of trade policy and its connection to environmental protection. And very interestingly, the environmental impact of agricultural subsidies has become a topic of discussion in that forum. So while it hasn't it hasn't formally taken root in the Committee on Agriculture, um, I think there was a there was a an, 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 a first attempt to bring the topic to the formal committee back in March. Uh, some resistance to that idea, at least at this stage, for the reasons we've just been discussing. Um, but it's interesting to see that in this very informal structured discussions process, the idea of discussing the environmental impacts of agricultural subsidies has taken taken some root, has started. They've had presentations, I think, by the FAO. Um, I think we gave one. Essentially starting to review the evidence that we have about this. So it's, it's, it's not at all a formal process. It's not at all a negotiation. But it is at least a place where some of these things that don't get onto the formal agenda can start to be discussed. Let me see if I've, if I've understood the kind of hierarchy of discussions before I pass it to you, mm. Doa. Um, you have the COAS which negotiates changes to the rules or new rules, where so far discussion has not been that robust following MC12, uh, for all of the reasons we've, we've discussed and more. You have the Committee on Agriculture in its regular session, which is in charge of effectively discussing how the rules are being implemented. So what the WTO calls monitoring, where in fact you have seen 
some progress, especially focused on these NFIDCs and that food importing developing countries. So there is a work program emerging there. And then separately, there is a kind of conceptual, almost fact-finding discussion emerging among a subsect of members in the test D. Um, I won't try to remember that acronym because we, we built wtoplurilaterals.info.org uh, just to, to sort of understand these pluralaterals, and even we don't remember the acronyms, um, where they're having these conceptual discussions, trying to understand more with the, some members, I think, in that discussion, hope to bring elements of that into these regular committees. Okay, the, just to make sure I've got that clear. Um, but there was something that we, we sort of, we kind of touched on, but didn't really uh, explore there, was the Director General herself has made food security one of her, I would say, short to medium term focuses. She's been very, very vocal about it um, in the wake of food price instability and so on. Um, what is the Director General, uh, where is the Director General looking at these issues? Are there things that the Secretariat is doing outside of these processes? And are there things that, that she hopes to see out of them? Thank you. Um, I just, uh, it's working, right? Yeah. I just wanted to get back to the issue of fora in the WTO. Um, so in addition, of course, to, to, to what you've laid out, which is an excellent uh, overview of the situation, I think it's important to point out to the wider audience that's here, that's beyond trade negotiators, et cetera, that the entire WTO rule book contributes to can contribute to the greening of agriculture, not just the agreement on agriculture. So, um, you know, if we don't have trade in um, precision irrigation equipment, um, which are industrial goods and which have intellectual property uh, rights embodied in them, um, then we are reducing the potential for climate smart agriculture in some parts of the globe. If we don't allow uh, the goods and services uh, and the ideas that they embody to travel, we are limiting uh, the potential for climate smart agriculture. So the entire WTO rule book has the potential to green agriculture. We tend to focus on the agreement on agriculture because it has the word agriculture in it. But as any farmer knows, to do agriculture, you need a lot of industrial goods and you need a lot of services and, and preferably you need some very good ideas. So some intellectual property. Um, so I think all WTO fora in the end are super relevant. Um, your question, the Director General, yes, absolutely. The Director General has made food security a priority and that's why food security was so central to uh, MC12, uh, which is the 12th WTO Ministerial Conference. Um, and there really the priority was to address um, the kinds of instruments that governments have, have immediately resorted to uh, when glo various global emergencies struck. And, that was export restrictions, export restrictions on food, export restrictions on feed and export restrictions on fertilizer. Whenever there is a, um, uh, whenever there's a global crisis, the first in instinct of a country becomes to keep its, its food for itself, uh, lest it not find enough food, which is, you know, a natural initial reaction, but it actually ends up making things worse. And so the director general has really stressed that point. And therefore at MC12, one of the main outcomes was um, a decision on food security where countries commit to, to try to not restrict uh, export of food, feed and fertilizer when, uh, when this isn't necessary and when they are able to meet their domestic food security needs. So, so yes, it, she certainly made that issue central. Thank you so much, uh, Da. The, the last question I wanted to throw to you before we open it up to questions from the floor and online, uh, and I know we've already had some questions come in on Q&A, so Gare has warmed up his vocal cords and is prepared to, to speak. Um, but I wonder if each of you could briefly uh, give people a sense of where you think this these discussions might be going. Um, uh, you've alluded to it before about some some of the some of the conversations, but maybe um, since Doe has already given us a play, I'll start with you, Alice. Um, what are you watching in the coming year? If you don't want to make predictions about the multilateral system, which is very fair after the last five years, what what are you going to be watching next year on, on this issue? Yeah, I'm not going to make any predictions. Um, 
Do you know, I think, I mean, I, I've been, we've been thinking about this issue quite a lot internally. And, and from our perspective, what really needs to happen is a discussion that focuses on the three aspects of sustainable development and how agricultural trade policy, agricultural policy, and specific, specifically agricultural trade policy, can best optimize for environmental and economic and social, including food security benefits. Um, but we're we're not sort of naive in thinking that all those three can necessarily be perfectly optimized every time, right? And so essentially what I think needs to happen in some forum is a discussion about the policy options governments have and the trade-offs that they have to make between those three objectives and the objectives that they have for themselves and how their own trade policy can best be shaped to achieve those objectives, what they can do for themselves and what they need to do collectively because they can't do it optimally if they do it just by themselves. So I think for, for us, it's sort of it's a, a three-faceted discussion of the different objectives governments have and the trade-offs they will have to face in designing policy that tries to optimize for those three things. Um, and so I suppose what's interesting is that at the WTO, you have already relatively well-established discussion on food security, a work program to take that forward, great. You have you know, a more informal and sort of incipient discussion on the environmental impacts, at least of agricultural subsidies. Um, and then you have at least the potential for a renewed discussion on the trade and economic impacts of these. Uh, of agricultural policies and agricultural subsidies. So we have the potential for the three aspects to be discussed in the WTO. What we have at the moment is the three discussions potentially happening in different three different places. Um, it's probably the political reality we have at the moment. Ideally, maybe it's at the WTO, maybe it's here, maybe it's somewhere else. You, we can have a discussion about how those three conversations need to be connected because whenever environment comes up, quite naturally, two or three governments say, what about the economics? Whenever the food security comes up, quite naturally, two or three governments say, what about the environment? So eventually, the three discussions I would like to see linked somehow, somewhere. Uh, and I think a lot of what we've heard today speaks to the importance of that, because if you do try to have that conversation in isolation, someone still says, what about the economics or what about the food security? They just do it after you're halfway through the negotiations when it's too late to, to bring those in in a constructive way. So I think that's a, it's a really good, good vision for what would be helpful moving forward, if not necessarily a prediction of where we're headed. Um, Doe, was there, was there anything you wanted to share? Um, are you in the prediction business? I'm definitely not in the prediction business, but um, I think your question of what next and what do we foresee for next year is probably your hardest question so far. Um, I think that if, if we're going to see progress, um, a fundamental issue that needs to be addressed is the issue of fairness, which comes up in any international forum, whether in climate negotiations or in trade negotiations. Um, I think the developing world is very worried that in some, if some, if some of its fear is justified, some is probably more psychological than, than, you know, than a, than a real issue. But um, much of the developing world lives in fear of um, instruments of development becoming illegal in international for being taken away from them, you know, like the right to emit in the climate negotiations, uh, which, you know, which is very difficult because if they want to industrialize, they do need to emit. Um, <clears throat> Or in the WTO, when you talk about subsidies, you know, they worry that their right to subsidize, which historically, you know, developed world subsidies have been very high, et cetera. And now we're asking the developing world, which never reached the levels of the developed, to cut its own subsidies. And, and so there's this, there's, you know, there's going to be a need to address uh, the negotiations um, through the fairness lens so that we can make progress. And so the developing world does not feel that it's being prevented from achieving some of what has allowed developed countries to become what they are today. Uh, and I, I think that's going to be uh, quite fundamental um, also in order to balance food security against other objectives. I think that's a really good place to, to end sort of our discussion before we throw it to questions. This idea that in these discussions, you will often see the concern that things that look laudable on paper will become weaponized or become restrictive. And anyone looking to understand these negotiations, these discussions should remember that people are understandably, ministers are addressing it in part through that fairness lens, 
through that concern about hidden protectionism lens. And that's why so many of these things, you know, Marco began by saying, everybody agrees there's a need to do this, but this is one of those reasons it is so immensely hard. Um, and with that, I might turn to questions from the floor, both physical and virtual. We might actually start with online because I can see Gera's rearing to go. Um, it, as a reminder, if you have questions for us, you can drop them into the Q&A box uh, and we'll put them to the panel. And if you're in the room, simply throw your hands up and someone will run to you with a microphone. Yeah, please. Thank you, Dimitri. So uh, as you've been discussing, there have been four questions that have come up online. And the first question is from Renata Cristaldo, and she's asking about um, uh, repurposing subsidies, and subsidies are always for those who can afford them, she states. Uh, how is it possible to level the playing field uh, with those who don't have the resources to subsidize to begin with? And then she moves on to elaborate on uh, standards and uh, how to have resources to meet standards that are coming up. Then we have a second uh, question, and I think this is for Doha. Uh, could you please comment on the trade impacts on health and environment, environment which uh, currently are externalized in agricultural trade policies? How uh, do you envision to solve this? Just a simple little question, Doha. Um, then uh, back to uh, Dimitri, actually. Um, <laughs> when you mentioned gr uh, groundwater rules, to what extent are sustainability-related agriculture non-tariff barrier, non -tariff barriers uh, being discussed in SPS and TBT? And then we have a little bit of a technical question, which is a long question. I'll try to truncate it a little bit as uh, so a last question, uh, that the green box that has been explained allows countries to provide environmental subsidies to, uh, according to certain conditions. Um, and as, uh, then he mentions um, that uh, anchoring level of subsidies on costs incurred or income foregone. Some argue this criterion is too strict. Uh, for example, one might want to pay farmers the value of carbon sequestered uh, rather than simply reimbursing the costs incurred. Do green box rules rule this out? Okay, uh, I might take the, the cowards option out and begin with, with those questions in order. Um, Marco, I wonder if I could put that, that first question to you, um, uh, I think it was part of your presentation, as well as some of the comments from the panel, that there is this perception that subsidies are a rich country's game, that in order to spend money on agriculture, you have to have the budget to do so. Um, has the FAO looked at the distribution of subsidies uh, around the world? I know it's part of your presentation. And now I wonder if you just had any thoughts on what, if anything, could be done to address the inequalities arising from that or just generally any thoughts uh, in that regard? Um, sure, definitely. We have, we have looked into it. Actually, uh, I have shared the presentation that I, that I presented today, and there was a slide that I just kept. Uh, by coincidence, that slide cover a little bit what, what this question is, is looking after. Uh, but let me, let me before I, I could show that slide, because it's interesting to show how much more countries can do with the little budget they have. But, but before that, it's important to understand that you know, if big countries who are subsidizing a lot change the way they subsidize, that would have impacts on world prices. Uh, and the, the countries that do not have much to repurpose or to, 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 to reshuffle are recipients of those changes. Uh, and, and I would say that the WTO is the organization that would understand pretty well those repercussions. So any discussion should have a, that lens of understanding how the countries who have little to repurpose, and let me put it very clearly, low-income countries and lower middle-income countries would be affected by big price changes that take, take place elsewhere as the rich countries uh, do anything with subsidies. Now, if, if you don't mind, let me, let me also say that uh, in the low-income countries that FEO has studied, uh, obviously there is very little very little subsidies to repurpose or to shift around or to, to even think about how you green them up. Uh, but what we have done is, uh, is we have analyzed a, and actually we are doing country work already. Let me just show you this very quickly. I wouldn't take a minute. Uh, a, we have been working now on countries because in, in the FAO's perspective, 
there's already consensus that something has to be done about this. And we are now working with those countries who have very little to repurpose. And this is an example of what we are doing with Ethiopia. We have already engaged with the government of Ethiopia on this. And what you see here in this column is the current way of domestically subsidizing the sector of agriculture in Ethiopia. What you see here is called the basic scenario. And here you have all the types of transfers that are done in, 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 in Ethiopia. But we have been telling the government, what would, what would happen if you take that little budget that you are now transferring to the sector to farmers in different ways, and you do it more optimally? And here is something that I would agree on very much with DOA to achieve broader objectives, right? It cannot only be about greening because that is not what will make people you know, thrive in terms of the livelihoods, the way they eat, but also the environment they live in. And what we have shown is that, just look at this. This would be the gains in percentage and also in thousands that Ethiopia would experience if they reshuffle or they repurpose the budget more optimally, the very same money that they have. We're not talking here about more. We're talking here about doing trade domestically differently, transferring to the farmers differently. And only by doing that with the same money, you see that more than 2 million people could afford a healthy diet that they cannot afford today. And obviously also you would be creating a lot of jobs. But the bottom line here is in order for you to do that, the objective could not be just greening subsidies or greening the expenditures. You have to have the objective of people in mind. You know, and in trying to, for example, keep people in mind, you would, for example, couple a subsidy to the production of a good that is healthy, but coupling this, this to a subsidy that is also green, so to speak, right? Uh, a subsidy that is climate smart or a technology that is climate smart, but what is key is what the other panelists have mentioned. These subsidies of this technology should be accessible to all. Otherwise, it would not make sense to do anything about this. Over to you. Thank you so much. And it's interesting how much your first point resonated with Doha's point about everything in the WTO rulebook being relevant to sustainability in the same way what anyone is doing on sustainable agriculture is relevant to, to everyone because of its impact on food availability, food prices, and so on. So that interconnection is really important, as is, I think, your, your second point about how much can be done by refocusing where subsidies lie in order to have them better achieve different objectives. I think that, that's, that's a good answer. Obviously, the fundamental question of how you resolve a problem like some countries having larger budgets than others is difficult, but I think that's a really good place to start. Um, I might go to the second question of uh, Doa, how are you going to fix inequality? Um. <laughs> um, I think the question to me was on the uh, impact of trade on health and the environment, correct? Um, so, um, so I think the purpose of international trade in agriculture and the purpose and the reason why WTO is in that space um, is to ensure, as I said, an efficient allocation of natural resources as international trade takes place, but also uh, to enrich the human diet. So in terms of the health impact, uh, first is the environmental impact an efficient allocation of natural resources, but the, the health impact is uh, is a wider human diet. So, you know, I'm sitting here in Switzerland now, if I were to go out to a supermarket right in the middle of winter, I'm going to find bananas, I'm going to find kiwi, I'm going to find all sorts of things that wouldn't have been possible that are enriching my diet today that wouldn't have been possible had international trade not been there. Um, so I think that's fundamental. But what's important is for us to continue the trade reform process because some national policies run counter to that overall goal for which the WTO entered that space. And I think, Marco, the FAO has done a terrific job in highlighting where you know governments sometimes go wrong in their trade policy and in one of the sofa recent sofa reports there are fantastic examples of you know governments that undermine nutrition by imposing tariffs on fruits and vegetables you know those are not this is not where you want to put your tariff. This is, you know, on fruits and vegetables and, and nutritious foods, this is the stuff that you need to make more accessible, not the stuff that you need to be impeding. And so, and there are fantastic examples of how, you know, bad trade policy hurts nutrition in a lot of the FAO reports. Thank you. The third question was, was I think, to me, 
I, I made the mistake of mentioning something specific, uh, which is how you get caught out in these things. Um, and, and the question was kind of what are the sanitary and phytosanitary and what are the technical barriers to trade uh, conversations happening around sustainability? To what extent are they going to, I suppose, forbid some of these kind of things we were talking about, about hidden protectionism? Um, and I'll say this is painting with a very broad brush, but fundamentally the WTO rules on regulations say that you can regulate in almost any way you like, provided you have a legitimate policy objective, provided you're applying your measures equally to everyone, and provided you haven't created a, it's not just a fig leaf over a distortion to trade, a protectionist distortion to trade. And that, um, that kind of dynamic means that if you do have a situation where wealthier countries are able to raise the way that food is produced on their own territory to a certain level, and then if they were to then horizontally apply a measure that says this is what food has to be in order to enter our territory and to circulate on our territory, it has to conform to these higher standards, Actually, there would be pretty significant limits on what the WTO rules could do to prevent that. And that's even before you get into the fact that, unfortunately, right now the WTO's appellate body uh, does not have any members on it. So you, so there is limits to how much of a final ruling you could get in any kind of dispute that arose from this. And so while there is certainly the, the WTO rules can certainly prevent the most egregious uh, examples of this and people misusing um, really blatantly, you know, declaring that that only an Australian apple could possibly be green by virtue of being Australian. That's the sort of thing the WTO can be a bulwark against. It's not necessarily automatically addressing some of the concerns we've talked about today. I'm seeing nods from Dole, which is a very encouraging sign. Uh, uh, the the last question on on green box, I might I might pass to you, um, Alice. It was kind of a uh, as guess as a very technical question uh, about what's currently in green box is it too restrictive is it too permitting um just any kind of general comments on that and we might pass the actual question on to you and doa in writing afterwards um to see if there's a if there's a more comprehensive uh, answer you might be able to provide no thank you dimitri I mean, it was i don't think i got all of the question but it sounded like a really interesting question for a lawyer and i confess i am one um, about payments for carbon sequestration and how much that fit into the definition of subsidies from the subsidies agreement, which of course covers the agricultural agreement as well. Um, I'm not going to cover that, but I will say maybe just three things, two things about the green box and one thing about WTO jurisprudence. So two things about the green box. Firstly, um, it is the, the kinds of market interventions, the kinds of subsidies listed in the green box are listed in what's called a non-exhaustive list, right? which essentially means that it's not just the things specifically listed there that could be included. There could be other things as well, first point. Um, secondly, the, as I understand it at least, the fundamental constraining factor in the green box is whether this subsidy is linked to production and distorts trade. So that is the fundamental, the fundamental limiting factor on what can be in the green box is that qualitative requirement. So two things to bear in mind. Um, and the very last thing, and this is a very personal comment about WTO jurisprudence, that's the decisions that panels make when one country sues another, um, is that I've seen a number of WTO panels and the WTO appellate body bend over backwards in their interpretation of WTO rules to ensure that governments have space to take measures to protect the environment. I mean, bending over backwards to the point that they've been hotly criticised by academics for doing so. So at least the direction that I've seen WTO disputes taking is very much to provide as much space for governments as possible to achieve important policy goals like protecting the environment. I'll leave it at that, but it sounds like a really interesting question, so I'd be happy to respond in writing if I can. Thanks so much. Um, scanning the room, I don't see any hands waving, but we've got one more question from online and we might end it after that. So, Gare. Thank you. We have a last question here. Uh, it's Asha Koshravi, who's, uh, who's asking, I was wondering about how we can move away from governments taking decisions on agricultural policies, which is harming the environmental health for the entire world. 
so I suppose to, to bring that question back to the back to kind of the WTO and, and the trade system, because I think it's a, it's a far broader political question of how you intent, how you kind of create positive change. Um, Doa, uh, you, you've talked quite a bit about what the WTO system has has contributed. Do you think that there are things that member that members and the system can be doing to just encourage better, more thoughtful policy making around these issues? I think you mentioned that the FAO and some of their reports ha have been very un-UNI and said these are some policies that are having adverse effects. Bad government. Um, what can the system do to encourage? the kind of change that, that the Oscar wants to see in the world? Um, I think the first thing is to get away from the misconception that there are governments that are okay with hurting the environment. You know, no government is okay with hurting its environment. There is no government uh, that would have the option of improving its environment uh, through its agricultural trade policy that wouldn't do so. I think the problem is a problem of trade-offs. Um, you know, so there are there are some difficult trade-offs that need to be done on the ground. Uh, you know, do, there there are different objectives that need to be balanced, and I mentioned those before, from food security to to employment security. You know, there are countries in Africa uh, whose ninety percent of whose population is employed in agriculture. So you know, so there are so I think governments have to contend with different challenges, but no government wants to hurt its environment. It's a matter of how to get to that goal. Um, and I think we are we are getting there slowly in the WTO because overall the system is moving in the right direction, but it is a bit slow. You know, if there is one thing that I really hope we can do through the WTO reform process, and I, I hope that members may look at this, is to actually televise committee meetings. Because I don't think people realize what a committee on agriculture meeting looks like. And it is one of the best examples of why the WTO has been created. You know, usually the agendas are, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 pages long with a, a country putting a concern to another country, another country responding. And there you really see what governments have to deal with and what are the things that block trade and what are the responses given and what the value of the WTO is. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I'll end on that note. That'll be a really, a really interesting idea, possibly for a reality show. Um, but uh, perhaps, perhaps Netflix doesn't have too much to worry about. Um, well, th this looks like a fantastic place to to end this session. A huge thank you to all three of our panelists, Alice, Do, and Marco. Thank you for a very stimulating discussion. Thank you to everyone who's born with us uh, throughout all four of these sessions. Thank you to the FAO. Um, and I might I might just leave with a plug for for two really great sources of information. Um, IISD does, does some of the best sustainability analysis, but also uh, sort of deep, deep read reporting on what is going on in sustainability and agriculture and sustainability and trade broadly. So I can't recommend their work enough. Um, and I think the WTO has also, especially over the last couple of years, really revamped the offerings on the website to be both much more in-depth and accessible. Um, so those who have been intrigued by this discussion um, are very much encouraged to check them out. And of course, Marco showed showed off just a small sample of the fantastic reports that the FAO itself produces uh, on all of these issues. So there is a wealth of a wealth of information out there, and that is up to date, interesting, and food for more thought. But with that, let me once again thank our technical team, thank everyone here, and wish you all a lovely holiday season. Thanks so much.